addition to calculating heart rate, the fact that distance on the ECG paper equates to time allows us to use the readout to time the duration of the major events of the cardiac cycle. We've seen that at a standard recording speed of 25 millimeters per second, five large squares corresponds to one second. Therefore, one large square corresponds to one fifth of a second and one small square to 0 0.04 seconds. There are a few numbers coming up now which you simply must learn. In a normal heart, the time between the onset of atrial depolarization, the beginning of the P wave, and the onset of ventricular depolarization, the beginning of the QRS complex, varies between 0 0.12 and 0 0.2 seconds, or between 3 and five small squares. This is the PR interval. The PR interval is made up of a number of elements. The first component, represented here in blue, is the time taken for the depolarization wave, normally generated from the SA node, to traverse the atria and reach the AV node. You will notice that depolarization reaches the AV node well before the end of the P wave. However, the AV node delays the transit of the impulse into the ventricles. This physiological delay in the AV node is the second major component of the PR interval. The third contributor to the interval, shown here in green, is the time taken by the depolarization wave to transit through the bundle of Hiss and the branches of the intraventricular conducting system. You will learn later that many important disorders are associated with alterations in different components of the PR interval, manifesting as abnormal shortening or prolongation of this parameter on the ECG. Analysis of the PR interval plays a central role in diagnosing many different disorders of the heart. The PR interval ends with the release of current into the main muscle mass of the septum and ventricles from the terminal branches of the intraventricular conducting system. On the ECG, this point is marked by the onset of the QRS complex, and the next key value we need to learn is the duration of the QRS complex. The duration of the QRS complex represents the time taken for ventricular depolarization to be completed following the release of depolarizing current from the conducting system. It also includes the time taken for the recording needle to return to baseline when the flow of depolarizing current in the ventricles has ceased. The conducting system of the ventricles is a highly specialized tissue capable of transmitting the depolarization wave rapidly around the chambers. Note therefore that with an intact conducting system, depolarizing current is delivered to all sectors of the ventricles in a very short time period, and ventricular depolarization of all regions of the chambers is complete within 0 0.12 seconds, that is, three small squares. A normal QRS complex is less than three small squares in width. You will learn later in this course that the width of the QRS complex is absolutely central to the ECG interpretation of life-threatening arrhythmias. You must remember this number. The duration of ventricular repolarization is also important in clinical practice. The time between the onset of ventricular depolarization and the end of ventricular repolarization, that is the beginning of the QRS complex and the end of the T wave on the ECG, is termed the QT interval. When the heart rate is 60 beats per minute, the QT interval should be less than 0 0.45 seconds in an adult male, with a slightly higher upper limit for adult females. These upper limits lie between 11 and 12 small squares on the ECG paper. It is important to realise, however, that the measured QT interval varies with heart rate, becoming shorter as the heart speeds up or longer when the heart slows down. Therefore, particularly at higher heart rates, 
it is possible to miss an underlying prolonged QT interval. The discussion which follows may seem academic, but it is important clinically. Abnormally slow ventricular repolarization, evidenced by a prolonged QT interval on the ECG, places patients at risk of fatal arrhythmias when treated with certain commonly used drugs. The ability to identify prolonged QT in these patients can lead to the use of alternative medications and avoidance of sometimes fatal arrhythmias. When faced with an ECG with a heart rate other than 60 beats per minute, to calculate the true underlying QT interval, referred to as the corrected QT interval, we use the formula shown on screen. The corrected QT interval is equal to the observed QT interval divided by the square root of the RR interval. The RR interval is the distance between the preceding R waves measured in seconds. This sounds horrendous but it's pretty straightforward. Let's try and calculate the corrected QT interval on this readout from AVL. The patient is male and the heart rate is 100 beats per minute. The observed QT interval on the ECG is 8 small squares, or 0.32 seconds. The immediately preceding RR interval is 3 large squares, or 0.6 seconds. So the corrected QT is 0.32 divided by the square root of 0.6. This computes at 0.41 seconds well within our upper limit of 0.45 seconds. So this patient does not have prolonged QT. To give you a simple rule of thumb, when you look at an ECG, if the observed QT interval is more than half the RR interval, at least consider the possibility of prolonged QT. The use of AVL in this example is quite deliberate. For reasons we will discuss in a moment, there is variation in the length of the QT interval between different leads. Also, for technical reasons, it can be difficult to identify the end of the T wave in many leads. It is recommended, therefore, that you analyse the QT interval in one of four leads, AVL, AVR, or one of the right-sided chest leads, V1 or V2. We should point out that the equation we have used here to calculate the corrected QT was developed from empirical observations on male volunteers in the 1920s. While useful, it does not yield perfect results, particularly at high heart rates. In addition, as well as varying with gender, heart rate and between leads, the QT interval also varies with age and even with the time of day. We don't raise these issues to confuse you, but merely to emphasize that it is difficult to assess the clinical significance of minor levels of QT prolongation above these accepted upper limits. The key is not to miss gross prolongation or major changes in the interval. Before we summarize the normal values outlined in this video, there are some further issues in the analysis of the duration of the events of the cardiac cycle of which you should be aware. In an earlier video we studied the manner in which ECG leads record depolarization and repolarization. We learned how the direction of travel of a depolarizing or repolarizing current relative to a lead is the key determinant of the sign of the deflection produced in that lead. We will expand on this analysis in future videos, however for now it is important to realise that if a depolarizing or repolarizing current is travelling at 90 degrees relative to a lead, it will not be recorded by that lead. As the ECG leads record electrical events from different perspectives, a lead observing this current from a different angle will record it. 
One important consequence of this is that an electrical event in the heart may be recorded by some leads but missed by others. For this and many other reasons the duration of the major events of the cardiac cycle appears to vary between ECG leads. Looking at this stylized example, in the three model leads shown, the current generating this small physiological Q wave in lead X has not been detected by lead Y, while the current generating this small S wave in lead Z has not been detected by lead X. So which readout represents the true QRS duration? In fact, the true QRS duration is represented by the difference in time between the earliest ventricular depolarizing current detected in any lead and the latest ventricular depolarizing current detected in any lead. So in this simplified example, the true QRS duration is enclosed between the blue lines. Extending this type of analysis to 12 leads is obviously not possible with the human eye. As a compromise, when analysing the QRS duration on an ECG, we choose the lead with the widest QRS duration. When analysed manually, the width of the QRS complexes in the lead with the widest complexes defines the QRS duration on the ECG. We use the term manually as most modern digital ECG machines are capable of recording all 12 leads simultaneously and use computer programs to identify the times of the earliest and latest deflections of the QRS complexes in all leads. These machines then report this integrated QRS duration on the printout. This tends to represent an accurate estimate of the duration of all of the events of ventricular depolarization and will always tend to be longer than the human estimate based on the analysis of the widest QRS duration. Exactly the same problems exist for the analysis of the PR interval and the QT interval and modern machines will present you with an integrated value calculated using all 12 leads. The computerized calculations attempt to eliminate many of the problems we outlined when discussing estimation of the corrected QT. These machines will even present you with a diagnosis. So which set of values do you use, your own estimates or the computers? Well, both have merits, but it is important to realize that the computer analysis has its own difficulties and limitations. At the present time, the analysis of the most complex of ECGs still rests with you, so you must be able to do it from basic principles. And to do so, you must understand or at least be aware of these principles. The importance of the normal values outlined in this video will become increasingly obvious as we discuss the ECG in disease states. Memorize them. The PR interval three to five small squares. The QRS complex duration less than three small squares. And the QT interval an upper limit of just over 11 small squares at a heart rate of 60 beats per minute and approximately less than half the RR interval at other heart rates.